When you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. And unfortunately, that's where Dodge finds itself today. And this hurts me personally because you know, I'm a lifelong Mopar guy. The Dodge nameplate actually means something to me, even though I'm not involved in the current offerings. But that's besides the point. Dodge, a great legacy American nameplate is, mm, it's on life support. So they introduce the 2024 Charger a couple of few weeks ago, and we did the video on that. And it's an absolute debacle. The, the, the video, the introduction video has 860 something thousand views at this point with like a 70% dislike ratio. Imagine that, imagine that. 70% of the people who viewed this thing rejected it out of hand, right? Just done, okay. And you know, I feel bad for Tim, Tim Kaniscus. And Tim, I'm talking to you in this video. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw some stuff at you. And, and I think, okay, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. Hang on, Tim, we're gonna get there. All right. So the Charger is DOA, right? It's dead on arrival. If they sell any of them, it's probably gonna be the same situation they have currently with the Hornet. The Hornet, okay? They've, they've sold like 9,000 of them last year. Right now, currently, there's a 500 and some odd day supply of these things currently in the network. So in other words, if they don't build another one, it'll take them 500 some odd days to sell off the ones that they've already got. Okay, this is just a joke, right? Then there's the Durango, which I have no idea wasn't absorbed over into RAM, and it's on borrowed time. Police departments buy Durangos, so that's about it. Then yesterday, you talk about a company on life support. Yesterday, Stellantis announces that they're laying off or they're firing 400 people. One shot, clean deal, right? 400 people from the engineering department you know, when a car company just drops 400 engineers, just like that, you know there's trouble, okay? And there's trouble all the way across the board there. So Chrysler is down to a minivan, right? The, the mighty Chrysler, right? Chrysler. They sell a minivan. That's it. They have one vehicle. It's a minivan. And the Jeeps, Jeeps aren't selling either. You know, the Ram trucks aren't selling. It's hard to move. $100,000 plus pickup trucks. It's hard to move $80,000 Wranglers, okay? This is just, it's absurdity. It's absurdity. Just to get sidetracked for a second, right? What they should have done instead of killing the Challenger was killed everything else and kept the Challenger as the Dodge. If you're going to have one vehicle, right? Make it the Challenger and turn it into like one of these legacy models, like for instance, like the way Volkswagen did with the bug for decades, don't change it every year. Just keep producing the same body, right? I and mean, change little things, add, add features, take features away, just to make it interesting. But you know, uh, it was a good looking car. It was a classic looking car. It appealed to, to a great number of people. I know it was a little puffy. Right? I, I, I look at, I look at the, the modern Challenger just being like, you know, it's had one too many Krispy Kremes, right? Compared to the first generation Challengers. But that's besides the point. They threw the baby out with the bad water by killing that and then going with the Charger. Now you talk about, you know, throwing a baby out with the bad water. The whole move to electrification on a corporate scale, this is corporate suicide. So in case it isn't blatantly obvious to literally everybody, regardless of what the, the, the commies and the moon bats and the fear mongers want you to believe, the internal combustion engine cannot be replaced in our current civilization. Our civilization, everything we have, our world, the modern world, is based on liquid fueled vehicles. Vehicles that can be refueled on the fly quickly, efficiently, and carry on. Everything we have, all our roads, our cities, our, our infrastructure, everything is based on that concept of a liquid-fueled vehicle. You can't have a storage-fueled vehicle take that place. So it's going nowhere. But the manufacturers and Dodge have decided to hang their hat on the EV. And this is what they're pushing now, okay, the Charger EV. But here's what they should have done, all right? Tim, listen, all right? Like I said, you guys, you have nothing to lose. Dead company walking, all right? So here's a radical idea. Here's something that I, I, 
I don't know why you guys didn't think of it, considering how hung up on the legacy of Dodge you are, or the history of Dodge, the Dodge brothers. All right. So before, before I, I unleash this idea, we have to look at history, okay? The history of Chrysler Corporation of Dodge. And by combining a couple of concepts, I think I have something that would literally turn the automotive world upside down, put Dodge at the most talked about, uh, the most progressive, the most talked about, the most interesting nameplate in the world. And you could do it using nothing but existing and primitive technology and stay within that EV world. Okay, I, I know this is gonna sound, I know it sounds crazy, okay? But hear me out with this. So the first thing we have to look at is the very first vehicle that could be considered part of the Mopar heritage, the Genesis vehicle from which all others evolved from over the last 130 years. Follow the bloodline all the way back and you come to an EV. Believe it or not, the very first car you can consider to be a Mopar is the Electrobat. The Electrobat. Okay, so this was a car that was produced beginning in 1894 in Philadelphia. And it was an EV. It had a 1,600-pound lead-acid battery. It had steel wheels, okay? But it was the first viable, successful, mass-production electric vehicle. It was sold mostly as cabs. At one point, New York City had like 10,000 of these things running around, uh, around 1900 or so. The Electrobat had a range of about 25 miles and it had a top speed of about 20 miles an hour. But again, see, in 1894, that was a big deal. So the Electrobat, the company, was bought by another company and bought by another company and bought by another company. And around uh, the early part of the 1900s, 1902, 3, 4, whatever year it was, when it was clear that the liquid-fueled vehicle was going to be superior to the storage-fueled vehicle, it was done. But in the meantime, that company was eaten by another, eaten by another, eaten by another, and eventually by Maxwell, and that was eaten by Chrysler, and so on and so forth. So and then you come to where we are today. Now you follow that whole lineage back from 1884 to today. It all began with an electric vehicle called the Electrobat, and it was a successful electric vehicle in its time before it was displaced by liquid fuel vehicles. Okay, that's one example, or, or our first example. Then you have to fast forward 70 years to 1968 and the Plymouth Roadrunner. Okay, so now the Roadrunner. The concept of this vehicle came from a column that Brock Yates did in an early 1967 issue of Car and Driver, where he was talking about how performance cars had become too overstuffed. They had too many features, they were heavy, they were flashy, gaudy, and that that's not what the true performance enthusiast wanted. What the true performance enthusiast wanted was the biggest bang they could get for the buck. And he proposed a basic bare stripper sedan with minimal styling, like or in other words, like minimal like ornamentation or anything like that, just like a small emblem or two here or there so that people could recognize what it was. Uh, kind of like the plaid. You know, you gotta squint and see what it is, right? It was supposed to be a high performance car, best engine, transmission, suspension, all the other things that make the thing go fast and be fun but with none of the frills, none of the ornamentation, as light as possible, as cheap as possible. So with that, somebody in corporate got a hold of this column, says, hey, that's a brilliant idea. Passed it off to Jack Smith. Jack Smith organized or, 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 or put together the Roadrunner program, and for 1968, they introduced the Roadrunner. And the initial Roadrunner was very true to Brock Yates' original idea. 
Right? It was a bare stripper. Okay? It had a little bit of ornamentation, it had the hood, it had a couple of small emblems on a couple of small nameplates, but that was it. Other than that, the 68 Roadrunner was a bare stripper. There was nothing there. Okay? So the car came with bench seats. You couldn't even order buckets. That was the original in the first incarnation of the Roadrunner, so from 1968 to mid-1968. Because it started, the, high, the whole idea started to get diluted really quickly, like within several months of the introduction. But let's just talk about the introduction, the basic car, okay? So, it was a bench seat, rubber floor mat car. It had, you know, four speed was standard, right? And then an automatic was optional, no floor shift for the automatic, you put it on a column, no frills had a, a taxi cab steering wheel, as, as basic as possible. It was based on the post body, so there were no roll down rear windows or anything like that. It was The post was lighter and stronger than the hard top. Flip out back windows. It came with dog dish hubcaps standard equipment. So the 68 Roadrunner was just pure muscle. The whole point of it was cheap, basic, no frills muscle. And it caught on. Chrysler originally thought they were going to sell like several thousand of them, six, eight, ten thousand, like that. They ended up selling 44,000 of them in the first year. Then in the second year, they doubled that, and it was the car of the year. The initial 68 Roadrunner was the embodiment, the pure embodiment of American muscle car. And to this day, it really still is. All right, I, I know, I'm, I'm getting away from things, right? I'm not. You have to understand where those two cars fit in the history of Chrysler Corporation and in the history of automobiles in general. All right, so now, we're at this situation where, it says the, the, the moon bats, the commies, and the fear mongers have temporarily won, and the automakers have caved, and, this, and, and yes, we're going to go EV and dodge right with it. I know it's just a temporary thing. I know it's not going to last. Anybody with any common sense knows that it's not going to last. There are way too many hurdles and deficiencies and issues and... Okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into the, the whole anti-EV rant again. But, Tim, okay, Tim, why don't you try this? Since the ship is going down, okay, the, the life rafts have already taken off. The ship is going down. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? Why don't you take the most basic, bare, no frills car that Dodge can conjure up? I mean, if you have to use the existing charger platform, fine, right? But the most basic, bare car you can imagine. Something like along the lines of a Dodge Dart, okay, like a like traditional Dodge Dart, or you even go to like your K car, it's just a basic box on wheels, right? No frills, nothing, okay? Just a bare bones, lightweight, stripped down car, just a sedan, right? Big wheels, obviously, and, and, and really nothing else externally to give any, any external, you know, idea that this was a, 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 anything special. Okay, just like the 68 Roadrunner. Now, give it the biggest, baddest battery that you can. Two big honking motors. Keep the weight as light as possible. Keep the price as low as possible. And make it as analog as possible. Now listen to me, right? I'm talking, but I'm talking for millions of people. There's a lot of people that are exactly like me. Okay? And especially in my age demographic. And we're the ones with the disposable income to go out and buy these cars. Okay, Keep that in mind. You price it around $25,000 and you make it as analog as possible. All we want is a big ass battery, a big motor at each axle, and the simplest controls you can conjure, right? And it's not like you have to dream up new technology. This stuff exists. It's existed for over a hundred years. Okay. The the, uh, the dirty word is software. Okay. The dirty word is software. As soon as I hear that something involves software, and I'm not talking about the computers that we use. Like I'm, okay, obviously, I'm using YouTube. Right? I'm using old technology for YouTube. But when it comes to my machinery, now, right? I want complete control over what I've got. So, you want 
For a throttle, you want a rear stack. We want roll down windows. We want dials on our, our controls. Our, our, we, want, we want to turn on a fan or a defogger. We want to actually turn it up. We want to turn on the windshield wipers. We want to turn a knob. No touch screen screens. Nothing like that, okay? Make it as bare and as simple and as, as just crude as you possibly can, okay? And shoot for the moon with it. Turn this unassuming appearing electric car into the quickest and fastest thing that man has ever produced. You can do it. It's there, okay? The technology currently exists to build an eight-second car, to build something that'll, that'll eat a quarter mile in eight seconds. If you take all of, all of the extraneous weight and all of the extraneous doodads away, and you give the thing just like regular door handles, okay? Old school stuff. You could do it. You keep you get the weight down into the into the 3,800, 4,000 pound range. All wheel drive, big fat wheels, big motor, more big motors, big battery, and slam that throttle and go. This would revolutionize. This would make Dodge the most talked about, the most interesting nameplate in the entire world of cars. It would turn the tide if it was priced accordingly and simple the way I'm seeing simple okay that like like a revolutionarily simple car in the tradition of what Dodge cars had always been Dodges were known to be simple rugged reliable cars serviceable cars that the average person can repair on their own I know that doesn't that's not the thing today but to millions of people out there like me exactly like me that means something. It's important. We would buy this stuff. I would buy one. If you came up with a combination like that, a car like that, a 68 Roadrunner based, or a 68 Roadrunner like car, electric, exactly what I'm laying it out to you, as simple and bare bones as possible, that sounds like an electric car. Let it sound like a trolley. Let it sound like a friggin' roller coaster, okay? Give it, let it just, leave all the sound deadening out. Leave all the stuff that makes it quiet and sterile out, all right? And just let it groan and whine and do all the things that a high-powered electric vehicle would, you know. You know what? There's an appeal to that. I would buy one. And, I, and I'm, I'm not just saying that because, oh, this is, you know, I, I, I have to endorse my own idea. No. If, if something like that was on the market, and like I said, it was priced reasonably. It has to be priced reasonably. I would buy it. And you can have different versions of it too. Not every single version of it has to be, you know, a, a, a McLaren eater, okay? You can have different stages of it. You know, the 1968 Roadrunner, bare bones basic performance car, targeted at the youth market. You know, the first recorded sale of 1968 Roadrunner was to a 44 year old housewife from Kansas. You see what I'm saying? It's like, you can sell them in all different ranges. You can sell them in all different levels of capability. But ultimately, the idea is now you're going to go completely against the trend. You want to be a rebel. You know, you want, you want Dodge to be the rebellion. You know, that was a big thing, the Dodge rebellion. That was a big uh, advertising. Yeah, forget about the scat pack stuff. Forget about all of that. Go the generation of advertising before to the Dodge rebellion. Be the rebel. If you're gonna if you're gonna play the electric car game, at least be rebellious about it and march the other way. Everybody's complicating stuff. More electronic systems, more software, more complication, more alienation to the mechanic, less analog. We'll go the exact opposite way. Give us something with roll down windows and simple gauges and knobs and dials and power up the wazoo. You will sell a zillion of the things that it would make Dodge the most desirable or at least the most controversial, the most talked about nameplate in the world. And it would do it almost overnight. Tim, I saw you choke down all of the dialogue in that video. Right? I get it, man. I know. You, you find it to be as much of a travesty, as much of an embarrassment as the rest of us do, but you know, I guess what? They pay you a lot of money, so you gotta tow the corporate line. Think about this, right? And you call it, what else? 
the electro bat. So you know you had the Roadrunner, right? You had the, the cartoon Roadrunner and all of that. Well, how about a cartoon bat that's shooting lightning bolts? Just a little emblem, just a little thing, right? Kind of like the Super B emblem, right? Just a little thing on the car, the electro bat, <laughs> right? Eat some Tesla for breakfast. It ain't gonna happen. But you know what? We can dream, right? I miss you, Dodge. Yeah, you really meant a lot to me. I'll see you tomorrow.